Uh, welcome friends to this uh, monthly meeting we have in order to remain on track on our spiritual path. The purpose of these meetings is that we, our mind being what it is, we often lose track of the high priority we are supposed to give to spiritual seeking and since the worldly affairs drag us so quickly into putting all our attention into them. So that is why it's a good thing once in a while to meet and find out that this is a much more important thing. And today I want to share with you one secret. Please keep it with you. <laughs> if you want to tell somebody, great urge sometimes comes, especially when it's a secret. If not a secret, nobody cares. It's a secret you want to share. So if you do share the secret, please tell them not to share with anybody else. <laughs> the secret is that I have been having these uh, intensive meditation retreats. I just completed one in California. I had three others in the last two days, two years. And I lead them for three days into meditation. First day, I explained to them how important it is to sit behind the eyes. That meditation outside on a chair, outside in a room, outside on a cushion, outside on a special chair meant for meditation, keeps your attention on those things. And therefore, it never pulls inside. If you have specially bought a special cushion, especially people show me special rug, carpet, we bought specially for this. Or we have set aside a special part of our house made into a temple, made into a place of worship. And that's where we sit and do our meditation. The fact that you have made it so special will automatically take your attention to those things. It makes it harder to bring the attention within. Therefore, before you start any meditation whatsoever, so long as meditation is for seeking higher awareness, not seeking higher energies. Then the path is different. If you seek higher energy, then the path is very different. You go below your eyes into the six energy centers. But if your intention is to seek higher awareness, the centers of awareness are behind the eyes and above in the little place in the head. They are not below the eyes at all. But if you are seeking higher awareness, the place to meditate is behind your eyes. That is why it is so important that if you want to do effective meditation, you should start from behind the eyes, close your eyes, feel you are there. Imagination is a great help. We are always imagining we are somewhere else without our body moving. Same way we can imagine we are in the little closed room which we create by closing our eyes. It looks dark, but surprising by imagination when you can see anything in the darkness. We can also imagine we are sitting there and we can see things in front of us. That's the starting point of meditation. I almost spend a day with them. And then I do the exercises and I tell them, did anything disturb you? Yes, everybody says. All raise their hands. Our thoughts were somewhere else. We were trying to imagine we are here. But we're thinking of things outside. Then you are not inside at all. So that is why we spend a lot of time trying to find ways and means to control our mind so it doesn't go outside. And simple methods like a repetition of words, which we call mantra or simran, are very effective so long as they are uttered by the mind and not by the tongue. If the tongue utters it, the mind can still run around everywhere. But if the mind is repeating them, it blocks that part of the time when you are repeating the words with the mind from thinking of other things. It's a mechanical thing. So once you can do that, it so happens that inside all of us is a strange kind of rhythmic sound that everyone can hear, provided you have got sufficient attention placed behind the eyes at what they call the third eye center. I take time in the IMRs to explain to them what third eye center is. And it's very interesting because I see a lot of uh, people talking about third eye center and they 
talk as if there is some place we don't know. They don't realize when we are awake in a physical body, we are at the third eye center. We cannot function unless we are at the third eye center. We are already there. When we see with these two eyes, how do we see? These two eyes don't see what we are seeing because they would see two different images. We go to 3D movies, they say wear special glasses and then the two images on the screen merge for us and create a three-dimensional experience. But do you realize the same thing is happening here? The two eyes are not seeing the same thing because of the separation. And the gap between the two eyes is exactly the gap they put on the 3D movies. The 3D movies are taken with the cameras, two cameras located exactly where our eyes are. And that is why the three dimension, three dimension effect is created. We are doing the same thing. But there we use glasses to merge them. Where are we using now? How do we merge these two images? The two eyes are seeing. If you try to understand where are you actually seeing from, you close your eyes, you still feel you are seeing. You're seeing images, imaginary. You open your eyes, you still see. Where are you seeing from? Third eye set. There's no other place to combine them. That is why it's important to understand it's not some place to search for. It is a place to gather your attention into. It's a place where you don't scatter your attention, put it back. Now, because of the misunderstandings about the very nature of third eye center, people spend years and years searching. I am searching my third eye center. While sitting at third eye center, we are searching for it. That's why you can't find it. Whenever you search, you search away from yourself and you are already what you are searching for. So that is why we take a lot of time in the IMR to make people practice, realizing that we are actually a third eye center. The whole process of awakening yourself is to pull your attention right where you are seeing from. So that's a good exercise and we do it for several hours. People like it. So we spend three days there, I tell them about the sound and they can pick up the sound and they can do all these exercises. Then we have a break for one day. So they can digest all they had. After break, I reveal to them the secret that I am going to reveal to you today. Secret is that was all a waste of time. <laughs> now that's why, why is it a waste of time? Because it's all a mental exercise. There was no spirituality in it. The spirit was not involved. Our own real true consciousness, the soul, was not involved. And no matter how much you meditate, no matter how many hours you spend on the three days that I spent, you don't go anywhere spiritually. You go into mental experiences. You can have mental experiences of being out of body. You can have mental experiences. You can be hypnotically placed out of body. A great good hypnotist can do it. It's not a great thing. It's a mental exercise. In mental exercises, you can even see the mind at work. You can even see your thoughts. But where is the spirituality in that? Spirituality is beyond the mind. And that is why those exercises do not take you beyond the mind. They remain you confined. Nobody has ever, with any kind of meditation whatsoever, gone beyond the mind. Meditation means meditating with the mind. So that is why it is so important to understand the spiritual path starts after that stage is covered when we have played enough with the mind. And we have played enough to, to make the mind exhausted. Say, I give up. Okay, now we are ready for the spiritual path. How does the spiritual path operate? The spiritual path operates if something within us can pull us beyond the mind. Now that is very important. It has to be something beyond the mind. We are living our life totally consumed by activities of the mind. Nobody has ever gone outside of the mind. That's the highest level at which we try to realize everything. We discuss things with the mind. We read books with the mind. We try to understand with the mind. That's all we do. 
and spirituality is none of these things. Spirituality is beyond that. So that is why the spiritual path begins where all this mental effort finishes. Now spiritual path is something pulls you beyond your mind, within yourself. And what is that? Something that the spirit does, the soul does without the mind. Now, what are the kind of things the soul can do without the mind? Thinking can be done by the mind. Talking can be done by the mind. Reading can be done by the mind. Discussions can be done with the mind. Discourses can be given by the mind. They all take time and space. Not even the smallest thought can be without time. But there are three experiences that we all have which are not taking time. One, the experience of love. When we fall in love or have the experience, it is so sudden, it is so spontaneous, it has never taken time. That is not a mental game. That's a spiritual experience. Sometimes we have an intuitive feel, intuitive gut feeling. We know something without thought takes no time. Intuitive thoughts come with no time. And therefore, intuition itself is a spiritual experience, not mental. If it was mental, you would think about it. There are some people who come and tell me, we are practicing how to develop our intuition. I said, how do you do it? Give me an example. So they gave an example. I am going to decide intuitively whether I will go right or left. Let me see how I decide. Uh, right. I want I said, I understand the right part, but what about the uh, before that? <laughs> you were thinking. That's a mental activity. That's not intuition. When intuitive knowledge, awareness comes, and it comes to us every day at some points, if you meditate on something real beyond the mind, intuition decreases so much that you will be having intuitive flashes throughout your day. But if you are only co concerned with the repetition of words and so on, it doesn't come. And yet it's a natural faculty in us. So long as we have a soul, we have intuition, we have love. There's a third thing also. A sudden burst of experience when you feel intensely happy, intensely blissful, without realizing why, what's making it happy. And no thought is involved in that. It's a state of bliss as against ordinary happiness or ordinary pleasure. That's also without time. Main distinction between the mind's experiences and the experiences of our soul are the mind always works in time space and the soul is beyond it. Therefore, what can pull us? Intuitive knowledge. What can pull us? Love coming from our own inner self and the state of bliss. It's a beautiful, that's the truth. That this awareness was described as sat chetaram was exactly the truth, the, the actual knowledge and anand, the joy, the blissful state which comes from above. And that is why the true spiritual state is when these powers can pull you inside. We have no knowledge of these powers. What has happened? How come that we all have this in ourselves? We experience it occasionally. How don't we use it to pull ourselves up? The reason is simple. There is a great wall we have created. Not a little wall, a big wall we have created called the wall of our own mind. Blocking all this. Even to Realize that, you have to think about it. We hear a discourse on love and mind thinks, what, how can I now love? What can I do to love? When you think of doing something to have love, it's not love. It's as simple as that. It can be attachment. Attachments can be created. Attachments come automatically also with desire. When you have desired something, you get attached to it. And we call it love. And we are attached to something because I love that. That's just a real misuse of the word love. It's an attachment. But 
true love is lying hidden in us and we don't know how to access it. We are living in a physical experience, in a physical body. Our whole reality is lying outside of a physical body. We are not looking inside at all. So since the whole body is reacting to what is happening outside of the body, we are looking even for our knowledge outside. We go to libraries to read books. We go to listen to discourses such as this one. We go to outside places for finding everything, including love. Therefore, we have designed something very interesting. And the design is that when we want to pull ourselves from within ourselves, our within ourselves projects something outside. What does it project? It projects something which suits us and provides us an example of love that lies within us. How does it provide an example outside? We will notice that when we have experience of love here, it's with human beings. We say we love our flowers, we love our house, but they, they, we, very quickly we can see it's an attachment. But when we experience that sudden love with human beings, we know that is love. Why do we break our love? We think too much about it. When you convert a spiritual experience into a mental judgment, then it breaks. And that's what we do all the time. But the experience to start with is real. So what can happen is another human being appears in our life who is a demonstration of not the kind of love that can break, but a love that is unconditional. When you experience that love from a human being, you are surprised that that person, human being, ordinary human being, like ourselves, does not judge us at any time, loves us without break, never modifies his love because we have not behaved properly or something, that his love is totally unconditional, something we don't experience in the rest of the world. So it looks very odd to us to have such a human being coming into our life. And that kind of love pulls us as if it is pulling us outside. The truth is that human being is not really an outside being. It's a projection of our own higher inner self. And that can be discovered. When you are pulled by love inside, which looks like being pulled by a human being outside, you discover that it was your own love pulling it. And where is the human being? When you go to that level of inner experience with your eyes closed from this physical world, eyes closed from the mental world, you see that human being was nobody else but your own self. But that's a very rare thing to have such a human being appear. When does he appear in our life? Can we find him? No way. There's no way to find such a person because he's too ordinary. How can we say somebody ordinary? Maybe anybody, everybody loves us, we love everybody. How can you distinguish between that? But such a human being coincidentally, circumstantially appears only when our seeking for our own truth inside is so strong that we are seeking the truth inside and he appears outside because we can't see inside. It's very simple. Such a human being we call a perfect living master. A perfect living master is merely a projection of our own higher self outside. And therefore, a perfect living master gives us experience right here in the physical plane of an unconditional love, which is actually only possible beyond the mind. And that is why it's a great arrangement. Who made it? Who made this such an arrangement? Our self. Our own self. Our own self has set up this arrangement because we did not come here to live forever and nobody lives forever in any body whatsoever, whether physical body or the so-called sensory body or astral body or even the mind, they all die at some point. Our soul, our true self never dies, was never born, never dies. Therefore, it came for a temporary experience into the region of the mind and the senses and the physical systems. And that is why we made the arrangement and we are tired of this, we don't want it anymore. It's enough of it. We don't like it anymore. We are fed up of it. Such a human being appears in our life. I have heard stories 
from thousands of my friends in the last 80 years. Thousands of my friends saying that's exactly when they met a perfect living master. When they're seeking what? When they're fed up of this place and they want to go to their true home where they belong. This is the true spiritual path. So the spiritual path starts way after the mind. Then why did I waste three days of those my beautiful, wonderful friends? Because if I don't waste those three days, they won't come to the fourth day. <laughs> if I don't lead you to what the mind can do, you won't come to the next step. The mind is so powerful. We made it powerful. The mind has no life of its own at all. The soul gives it life. The soul gives life to the mind. Soul gives life to our sense perceptions. Soul gives life to our physical body. And we are all alive because of our soul. And we have invested so much life into the mind, the thinking mind, which is supposed to be a very efficient computer-like machine, an accessory to our soul. We are given such a beautiful accessory to use, to create space and time and divide experience, which are held in one point. The Shunya point, which Buddha called the Shunya or nothingness, which contains everything. And that was extended into time and space, and we could have a variety of experiences. First at the mental level, we could have experiences later at the sensory level, and then at the physical level, and each level looked absolutely the only reality. That's also a wonderful thing, how realities have been created, not illusions. And the intention was never that the soul should experience illusions. People keep on saying, this is illusion. I, a man was saying it's, illu it's illusion. I said, if I give you a pin prick, you will know it's not illusion. <laughs> I read in Shakespeare, he said, there never yet was a philosopher who could bear the toothache patiently. He would give all the talks about illusion, and yet when he sat in the dental chair, he would scream, this is real. The dentist is real. Everything else is unreal. These kind of talks we have because we have no idea that anything else can be real. We are knocked into one reality at one time. It's a great experience. If you look from the top, the different realities created, you'll be amazed at the beauty at which the, the manner in which the beauty of these realities have been created. And each reality is locked into itself so that when we are the physical reality, only physical things are real. How it's created? By thinking the self is our body, physical body. The moment the concept of a self being a physical body comes up, the whole world, all experience becomes real for us. All physical experience becomes real. Know the reason. And scientists, psychologists are bothered today. The power of perception. Scientists, the area of physics, astronomy, Ever since this great thing called quanta came up, this quantum physics and quantum mechanics came up, I was wondering how an observer can change a wave into a particle. How an observer can virtually change something that is in the form of an energy into something that is matter. It's, it's gone that deep. In the beginning was very simple to study photons, the light uh, particles emitting, and they behave like, when they pass through two approaches, they behave like waves. They could go through both. But when you observed or measured them, they became a particle, went through one. This was a very old experiment. And they have been going on experimenting to determine what this quantum type of uh, physics lies ahead. Today they have reached a point where they think maybe the observation of a human being is creating all our reality. This is not metaphysics, this is physics today. And imagine where we are moving. And if this is true, which I can tell you is true, and you can establish it with your own meditation, this is true, that we create our reality with the kind of body that we think is our self. When we think this body is our self, and this is the only reality of our own self, everything else becomes real around us. Even though we know if we had no sensory perceptions, this whole experience would disappear. There is no other means by which we are getting any idea of a creation of this physical world except through our sense perceptions. 
It's amazing that we know all this. It's amazing we have recorded all these things. As yet we think the world was here earlier for billions of years. We read about it, history, there is a lot of evidence existing. We can see old mountains sitting here. We can see the, how, how the oceans were created. We came only for a short time. How can this reality be dependent on us? But we forget one simple thing. When we go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream we can go to a new tourist place. Somebody can take us to a new planet. A guide can say, come on, I'll show you a new planet. I'll show you how old it is. He show you the oldest buildings. They pre-existed before the earth came into being. And we enjoy it. And the dream looks absolutely real. And we believe that these things have existed for several billion years, more than our earth. And then we wake up and we discover that the billions of years existed in the last three minutes of our dreaming. I, when I came to the United States in the 60s, there used to be a lot of institutions dealing with sleep and dreams. I joined one of them to study how they are examining the dream state in relation to the wakeful state. Very interesting experiences because the subjects were placed on comfortable beds to sleep and dream and they could trigger dreams also by some actions which are triggered even in our, in our own life now. And they would put all the kind of uh, cameras to see the rapid eye movement of the eyelids and the eyes. And they could also see the um, vital forces, the blood pressure and how the pulse goes with, while dreaming and what, how many times we dream. And a very good experience. Everybody dreamt every night. And most people said we never dream. Dreams are erased so fast, according to a study recently, very recently. No dream can be remembered except a traumatic dream for more than 30 seconds after waking up. Most of them disappear in two or three seconds. You must have recorded it. I know the dream, but I just forget. I remember my dream. In my dream, I won a lottery, five million dollars. <laughs> and they said, check or cash? I said, cash. <laughs> cash is king, my partner was told me. <laughs> and they were going to count the cash. They were happy to receive. I woke up. I tried very hard to go to sleep to collect my cash. And then I could wake up. We can create a reality in a dream which has its own space and time of the same infinity as this one. We can withdraw our attention inside and completely withdraw attention completely from awareness of this physical world and we can still have a space and time and an infinity, bigger infinity than this infinity as actual experience. How can we say that these things pre-existed when we are creating it with our own level of consciousness, our own level of awareness? It's amazing. So when we see that our realities, the concept of reality, has been created by two things. One, that you shut off any experience of other realities. You're dreaming, you can't hold on to the experience of a physical reality. You have to forget where you are sleeping, which bed you are on, in order to have a dream in a sleep. So that is why, in one case, a man, in that experiment that I was talking about in the 60s, a man dreamt that he was a child. He was a child, not somebody else. He was a child. And he was growing up and he went to school. He remembers his school. And then he met a girl, nice girl. He fell in love. Teenage love, very wonderful experiences he had. Then they grow up. They decided to marry. They married. They had children. Then the children had the grandchildren. And he felt he was much older. He grew so old. And he woke up. Total dreams lasted seven minutes. His experience, one lifetime. What is the connection? There is no relevance between the time of the dream and the time that you created, what was created in the physical time. Same thing is true at other levels of realities, which we are not aware of when we are sitting in physical reality. But the beauty of this experience of meditation is we can access those realities by shutting off one reality, 
when you wake up from a dream, we shut off that reality and we open up a wakeful reality. If we shut off this one, we will wake up to a higher reality. It makes it's common sense that if we can do one thing, we should be able to do the other two. And we can do it under guided meditation. Thousands of people have done it. And my own friends, thousands of them have done it. And we can all do it. That's the simplest step to wake up to our, our reality and see that sense perceptions can exist without the physical body. And that constitutes a different reality altogether. When that opens up, this disappears. It's a different world of that kind. So everybody then experiences the same thing. So why I'm pointing out is that this locking up of each reality separately has caused the reality to become more real. Otherwise, it would look like just a fantasy imagination. Supposing we could be awake while we are dreaming, it would not look like dream, like a real dream. It will be just the daydreaming, just a fancy thinking about something. Same thing would happen if we had higher awareness at the same time as this awareness. It both look unreal because each is locked separately. And we have to get rid of one to go to the other. And that is why this has become more real. It's a very good system to generate an experience of reality. The second more important part of how this reality has been made real, how the proof of reality has been built into the reality is that we are using different sense perceptions to establish the reality of an object. I said, here is a cup of water. Is it real or unreal? It is real. I can see it. I can touch it. And now I can even taste it. Very nice taste. <laughs> Cold. I can even feel that. I have tested its reality. I can touch it. I can see it. I can taste it. I could even smell it. I could use all my sense perceptions to establish the reality. Now imagine I have the same experience in my dream. In the dream I see the same cup. And I and I'm checking with a friend of mine who's sitting there. And he's telling me it's a dream. And I said, no, it's not a dream. I can prove it to you. I said, prove it. I touch the glass. I hold it up. I take a sip. I can touch it. I can see it. I can drink it. It tastes cold. It's cold. It's real. And then I wake up. Where has the cup gone? Where the water gone? Now, what was real is still real. That I dreamt that there was a cup of water that I had. That was real. Because I had it. Nobody can deny it. That I had an experience of a cup. But from the experience, sensory experience of a cup, I jumped to the conclusion that the object called the cup is also real. When I woke up, I discovered the object was not real. Experience was real. This is the truth at all times. Experience is always real. And what we think from that experience is outside of ourselves, the outside of the experiencer, that that is also real, is the illusion. The object is not the illusion, because it's giving a real experience. The object is created by the experience. We think the object creates experience, and we say experience creates the object. Old debate going on for thousands of years, do you see a tree, because the tree is there, or it is, you are seeing the tree, therefore you see the tree. Old thing going on, they are still debating even today. Those who think a tree has to be there before you can see it, call the materialist. They can't get rid of the idea that there can be anything besides the physical reality and that material reality, we have to keep on exploring that. Even when evidence like quantum mechanics comes up, they still think we have to discover the mechanics of it, what's happening here. Those clearly saying, why don't you study why sense perceptions can change something? That they say is the job of a psychologist. You must be having a problem that you are creating something. The hallucinations. You are creating hallucinations. It's a great word. I, uh, I examined it at a big university, discussed with the professor, Harvard University, the term hallucination. Because at that time they were taking drugs to create hallucinations. LSD and they were coming up at that time. Two of the professors who used to discuss with me, they were fired for their experiments with those drugs. For mushrooms from Mexico, they were using those to start with and then they got things made in Europe. 
what they were discussing that the mind can create any image. I said, it's wonderful if you accept that. That is why these people with their drugs can hallucinate and see other things. It's the power of the mind to create these halluc hallucinatory effects. And because that person took a drug, therefore he saw that. It's a hallucination, not real. On what basis do you say that person was hallucinating and we all sitting here are not? Basis, numbers. He was one, we are many. Is that is a good reason for discussing the whole subject of hallucination, how hallucination occurs? When you are examining a patient and saying he hallucinates because of this thing in his mind, psychologists are examining it and they are saying there's something wrong here working and by that he can see a whole world. Is our mind working differently? Not at all. Take pictures of the mind. They have taken thousands of pictures of the mind of a hallucinating person and one is the same. On the other hand, there is a big difference in the picture of a young man and an old man in the brain. There is a big picture of a distorted mind that cannot remember of Alzheimer's cases. They have taken pictures. They are different. They are hollowness in the different parts of the brain. But when you say hallucinating and we are not, the minds are the same. The brains are the same. The pictures of the brains are the same. What is the conclusion? That just because, oh, we are larger in number, therefore we are not hallucinating. I can go back to a dream state again. And one man is telling us, you are all hallucinating. And we say, no, no, he is hallucinating. He is alone. And then we wake up, everybody was dreaming. Or everybody was part of a dream. One was dreaming, everybody was part of a dream. It was not real. There is no difference whatsoever between that case and the case of what we call hallucination. I had a big discussion. Ultimately, they said to me, you see so many things inside, you describe them. And you even describe our true home, the totality of consciousness, existence, where this all comes up. And then you describe in great detail the experiences you can have if you withdraw your attention from the body into those levels. Do you know the mind can create all that? Is that the power to create all that? I said, I'll accept it. Why argue? I accept it. The only difference I want to point out is you people who know all this knowledge are taking Prozac and are depressed. Most of them were depressed, by the way. And I'm happy 24-7. <laughs> it's a good way. It's a good way to uh, have some sort of auto-suggestion. You're saying I'm making auto-suggestion to myself and seeing all those things. What a wonderful way to teach people have a little auto-suggestion. You'll be happy 24-7. And Matthew Bertrand Russell says in one of his books, The Conquest of Happiness, he says, the whole world is looking for nothing but happiness. Everything that we are searching for, whether money or power or fame or whatever we are searching for, ultimate idea is to have happiness. And therefore we are all searching for happiness and we are not getting it. And here I told those professors, Richard Alpert, Timothy Leary, I said, you are not seeking happiness, I have got happiness. As you are saying, the happiness I've got is by a method called auto-suggestion. I think we should recommend auto-suggestion to everybody. <laughs> I said, no, it's not auto-suggestion, it's meditation. You can call it auto-suggestion. Supposing meditation leads to auto-suggestion and you can feel happy 24-7 and yet be efficient in your jobs outside. Efficient. I stood first in the university in my exam. I got an A plus at Harvard University in spite of my auto-suggestion. Therefore, if we are ex uh, exceeding even outside, having clarity of mind even outside and inside with auto-suggestion, it's a wonderful thing, but I call it meditation. You can call it auto-suggestion. Doesn't matter. Names don't matter. What matters is that we are finding the same thing that Bertrand Russell says we are all looking for. And that can be achieved through this process of meditation. Why we are giving so much importance to this physical, mental state of meditation is because the mind has been so brainwashed, not over one lifetime, several lifetimes, it has been so brainwashed, you can get nothing without struggle. 
you can get nothing without your own effort. Therefore, people come prepared all the time on a spiritual path, prepared to make effort necessary to find the truth. They say, what can we do? We are willing to do 8 hours meditation, 12 hours meditation. We do anything to find the truth. They are all come prepared for making effort. If I tell them the truth, effort will lead you no spiritual place. They call me totally idiot. He knows nothing. Why did, he, why did you come to him? He doesn't even know. Nothing comes without effort. We have to make effort. But the truth is, when you fall in love, you make no effort. When you get intuitive knowledge, you get, make no effort. When you are in that blissful state, suddenly you make no effort. So things come effortless. Spirituality lies in that range, in the effortless range, not in the effort range. Mental activity lies in the effort range. Everybody comes prepared for effort. So perfect living masters, fully aware of the fact that the truth lies beyond effort, will make them go into effort. Do meditation regularly for so long. Follow the dietary restrictions. Follow these rules. If you don't follow the rules, you have no chance. All this is just to tame the mind a little bit so that the mind can keep on the right and we can move on. No mind can be just sidetracked, bypassed and we can move on. That's all the purpose. We, our minds have occupied a place. We have given them a place so powerful. We identify ourselves with the mind. I think, therefore I am. A total wrong statement. The correct statement is, I am, I have a mind through which I think. I have a mind through which I think. When I need to think, I use a mind. I have got it. Nobody looks at it like that. We have, we have identified ourselves completely with the mind. And now here we are trying to go over the mind and the mind says, I can do it. I know how to do it. So that is why those three days which I thought was a waste were not waste. That's another secret. <laughs> that you have to go through the mental exercises in order to reach a point where you feel it's not a method of mental effort. It takes you to some experiences, good experiences, which also tell you this is not the only reality. That's good enough to know this is not the only reality. A mental meditation, mental effort can lead you to that. I remember a friend of mine who wrote a very nice letter to me. I have studied the whole spiritual path. I have studied all these books. I have come to the conclusion that this is not a path of effort. So I have now decided that this is an effortless path. And the last line was, I am now going to make my best effort for the effortless meditation. <laughs> Can you imagine the mind never saw that? The mind never saw you contradicting yourself. But he actually wrote that. Imagine how our thinking process was. That we can't think of anything coming by itself through love. And that is why, what is the role of a human being? We call a perfect living master, he's an ordinary human being. What's the difference between that human being and ourselves? No difference as a human being at all. Some people think he might be somebody special, created, not at all. He's an ordinary human being, born like us, dies like us, falls sick like us, eats like us. If he's a clean shaven man, does shur 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 like us, <laughs> shit shaven <and> shower. <laughs> Therefore, it's, a, it's an ordinary person. Only difference is his awareness. His awareness is open where he can see more than one reality. He can see all the realities. He can see the origin of the realities. He can see the origin of consciousness. He can see the work of the consciousness. And he can see it 24-7. Not that he saw one day and has come to tell us what he saw. Many people can do that. I saw something and I have come to tell you. That's not a perfect living master. A perfect living master is one, 24-7 he has all the awarenesses intact. And he is seeing the whole show from that perspective of the creator, creation and the whole thing together. If he is not seeing that, he is not a perfect living master. And if he can't see who the seekers are, not a perfect living master. He can't know at what stage we are, he is not a perfect living master. That is why these perfect living masters are very rare. Extremely rare in this world. Masters are very common. They are growing by numbers. Great master, picture you see, my master, was a perfect living master, I can guarantee from my own experiences. He said, probably there are 
going to be more master than disciples now. The growth of masters is so fast as a business. And that is why perfect masters are rare. Why are they rare? Because seekers of the truth are rare. Seekers of the ultimate truth beyond the mind are very rare. Most people, even when they go to perfect living masters, they say, Master, so and so is sick in my family, please help. Master, I lost so much money, can you help me to recover it? I get, I myself, I am an ordinary disciple of this master, but I am telling you from the awareness from this master that I get thousands of emails. I get three, four hundred every day. And 90% of them are requests for something worldly in this. A few of them are requests for an astral experience, radiant form. And some very rare 1% want to know the origin of everything that created from the universal mind. Less than 1.0001% want really to have experienced the true home above one's head. In my, in my experience. So you can imagine how rare this seeking is inside us to seek something beyond the all. And even in the spiritual path, this great master said, the spiritual path starts from beyond the mind. What we in Indian language say, power of Brahman. Up to the Brahman or Brahman, there's a creative power of everything here. The spiritual path starts beyond the mind, at power of Brahman, where the soul recognizes itself as the creative power behind all creation, and yet, is still a soul, and many souls, one amongst many. So that is the beginning of the spiritual path according to him, and what the destination is, when the soul discovers, is not separate, but one, and only one, is part of that one. And this is important, I keep on reminding you, that this whole concept, that we were souls, and we left our true home, and are lost somewhere now, and we have to struggle hard to find our way back and go to our true home, itself is a mental game made up. That's not the truth at all. What's the truth? The truth is the soul never left its home. The soul is part of the home. The soul is part of the one total. A total can't be total if one is left. Therefore, it remains total. The soul has always been in the total. It only lost awareness for a purpose. People ask me that purpose. Explain rational purpose. Why, if there was only one consciousness, one soul, totality, why did it become many? A good question. And mentally, we can find a good reason for it. The reason simply is that one soul was love. L-O-V-E, capitals, in the highest sense. One soul was love. Not a lover. It can't be lover if there is only one. Not a beloved. One soul was love. The many within the one became the lovers and the beloveds. Love became an experience by one soul containing all the souls. The one became the many at the same, same state of being, which is beyond space and time. These are experiences you can actually have as physical human beings with that higher awareness, which is possible inside each one of us. It's amazing how much potential we have inside ourselves. And that potential can lead you to the experience of the one and the many being the same at the top. That is where we really belong. That's where we discover the whole purpose of creation of the many in the one. And then we discover the purpose of the one independently experiencing other things by adding on a mind to create space-time for experience, adding on sensory perceptions to further enhance the experience, to add bodies, physical forms, to create a physical reality, and that can be blocked more effectively from other realities. That's where we are sitting now. It's a beautiful experience, all open to us, right inside us, and we all have access to it. Then what is the requirement? What is the requirement for having all I'm talking about? Only one requirement. Seeking. Know the requirement. If you seek for that inside you, it'll happen. I've seen not only thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases in my lifetime. 
seeking was a secret, seeking anywhere on the globe, and perfect living master was in their life. If you seek the highest, you get the highest. Seek and you will find. That's always been true. And therefore, seeking inside, not shouting outside, not going anywhere outside, seeking within yourself will reveal. If you seek that inside, a human being can appear like an ordinary human being and you will say, mind will question, mind will doubt. I happen to make some statement which I don't know if I should have made at the IMR. I said, masters are thieves. Not a good thing. They could be convicted for theft. But I said, masters are thieves of our hearts. But we have very good bulldogs, sharp, sharper than bulldogs, defending ourselves. They're supposed to be our guards, dogs, big dogs, guarding. The dog is our mind. It barks its doubts. It barks its fears and keeps everything away so we can't, nobody can enter. Even our master can't enter at all. Master sneaks somehow through and steals our heart. In spite of the, he gives a little, what he does, now listen, it's a very practical analogy I'm giving. He throws some meat or something, or throws something <laughs> else to the dog. Have these experiences. Okay, have these wonderful experiences. And the mind enjoys experiences and the master sneaks in and steals our heart. I remember the story of that famous yogi from Karachi, Swami Brahmanandji, how great master met him on the invitation of uh, my uncle who was working in that town and how when he came, great master sat next to him on a love seat and when, when my uncle and aunt told uh, that Swamiji, to whom they used to go for Ayurvedic medicines, that our master is coming. He's a perf perfect living master. His name is Baba Savan Singh. A white bearded man, an old man, and uh, he'll come and meet you and give you blessings. So when Brahmana said, just bring him to me, I will give him blessings. So they couldn't know who is going to give a blessing to who. So they arranged this lunch at their house and put both of them. The great master was staying with them on, the, on his, what they call love sofa, two people, and put Swamiji on the other side. And when uh, great master was told he's the Swamiji, great master folded his hand, put his head down like this. And Swamiji raised his hand and he says, I bless you. I saw that scene. I said, this is all top seater. <laughs> I thought that great master will give blessing. But great master was ordinary dressed, almost the same he's wearing, almost that. And the Swamiji was wearing very nice saffron colored robes and a saffron colored um, beautiful muffler, which he was holding like this. And a nice cap, same color. Looked very beautiful. He had very beautiful eyes too. I still remember his face. But when they sat, great master turned to him and said, Swamiji, what a pity that all the Swamis are only connecting their attention to the energy centers below the eyes. What a pity they are only interested in energetic experiences. Nobody is concerned with higher awareness. And all are confined to six chakras, six centers of energy. And they are not even aware of the twelve chakras of awareness that lie in the small part of our head. The Swami said, Master, I have never heard of these twelve chakras. Said, Don't you know the eighteen chakras? I know six of them, but where are these twelve? Never heard of them. He said, have you never heard of the six chakras of Anda and Brahmanda? And then such Anda. The eighteen chakras are in total body and we are putting attention only on these for energy and not going within to those chakras? He said, Master, I never heard of them. Will you please explain to them in a little greater detail? Great Master said, do you know it's a big subject? And if you come to my headquarters, and you are most welcome. You will be a special guest of mine. You come there, I certainly take time to explain them to you. So, the meeting lunch ended and Great Master left back. Next day, the Swamiji told my uncle and aunt 
I couldn't sleep all night. I was wondering about those twelve shakas. Where are they? I have to go and see him again. So he wound up his ashram and told all the inmates of the ashram, I am going because somebody is going to talk, tell me about 12 chakras. If I can learn those 12 chakras, I'll come back and teach you. Meantime, this is disbanded. If you want to come along, you can. And he came to the Dera, the great master. Great master ordered, Swami Brahmanandji is coming, be, he be given VVIP treatment. The best suite in the guest house we reserved for him. Four attendants should attend to his needs so that he doesn't feel uncomfortable here. I have invited him as a very special guest. He has access to see me 24-7 anytime. Others had to wait in line long time to have his darshan, to see him. And so the Swami was moving around without an authority granted to him. And he looked very nice as he walked with, you know, he walked in style. I still remember him there so well. And he was attended to by so many people living in the best place in the Dera. And one day he decided to test if the great master was really sincere when he said, you can see me anytime 24-7. In the middle of the night, 12 o'clock midnight, he walked up to the master's house. And the attendants there were told he has access 24-7. I've come to see master. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Swami. yes, Swamiji, certainly. And they went and woke up the great master and said, Swamiji here, bring him in. Swamiji went and met him. Yes, what can I do for you now? He said, oh, just came to pay my respects to you. Oh, very good. I'm very happy, very happy. We'll sit in satsang tomorrow together. So, there was a discourse by Great Master next day. Swamiji sat next to him. And Great Master said, he'll always sit next to me in my discourses. When Swamiji was sitting, Great Master said, Look at all the Swamis and Yogis confined to the six centers of energy. No, nothing about the higher centers of awareness. True spirituality lies above and not below. And this man was listening like this to the Master. After a couple of days, he said, Master, I have a problem. What is your problem, Swamiji? My problem is when you speak, I want to listen attentively and I have to look at you to do that. And I have got a pain in my neck by keeping my neck like this. Great Master said, I also noticed that. I think it's better that you sit in front. So there from the high pedestal, Swamiji went down on the chair, right below. The, uh, there was a height of the days from which the Great Master was discoursing. After a few days, he complained again. He said, Master, I have a little problem. Yes, Swamiji, what is your problem now? My problem is, I sit so close to that high table of yours. I have to look up like this to look at you. I've got a pain in my neck. Great Master said, I also noticed that. Move Swamiji's chair 30, 40 feet into the crowd. So there the chair was placed in the center. After a few days, he says, Master, I have a little problem. Now, Swamiji, what is your problem? My problem is, I sit on a high chair. People are on the ground and people behind me can't see. My whole attention is on them. I can't listen to you properly. The great master, I also noticed that. Remove the chair. So there he's sitting like an ordinary person in the ordinary places. After a week or two, he is waiting for darshan like anybody else like us. Great master gave him a small little hut to practice his Ayurvedic medicine as he was doing in Karachi. Great Master had also given me a little hut because in those days I practiced up homeopathic treatments. So we both had our huts and one day I was sitting with this Swami comparing notes on our different methods of treatment of patients and he said, this Master is a great diplomat. He says, had he brought me and I had to stand in line when I first came, I would have gone back the next day. He treated me as a VVIP. He treated me with so much respect. So much love he gave me. Now he's trapped me with his love. I can't go anywhere. And then he got initiated. And then he did wonderful in his meditation. I used to compare notes with him. So masters operate in a very different way. How the Swami from such a far off place, more than a thousand miles away, was brought there. He was already seeking for something. He didn't know. So many people amongst us are knowing, we are seeking something inside. 
not sure what it is. We are not even sure of our own self. Because this contemplating on what we are seeking is a mental exercise. What we are seeking is not mental. And that is why we are not aware fully ourselves what we are really seeking. But the seeking is inside us. And that is why when the seeking is strong and intense, a perfect living master appears and appears by coincidence, appears by circumstance. And much later we understand how he came to us. And that's how our own spiritual development and spiritual seeking starts. And through some mental exercises, as I mentioned in the IMR, I'm mentioning now, we go to two spiritual path, which is based only on love and devotion. Nothing takes us beyond the mind except love and devotion. We have no experience of love and devotion. When a perfect living master comes into our life, we have an experience of love and devotion. Why am I using two words? I described the talk of love, and now I'm adding devotion to it. Because when we experience love, we become automatically devoted. Love pulls us. Devotion is a response to it. And it's automatic in us. Automatic in our souls, not in our mind. Our mind can still question, mind can still doubt, but love and devotion is a secret. Very happy you came and joined me today and uh, we'll have a lunch break. As I was walking in, I saw some food on the side. I almost stopped, but <laughs> I said no one o'clock. I'll see you a little while again at three o'clock. Thank you.